Welcome to this video walkthrough of the Aquadu programming challenge. I hope that you're ready to do some coding because we're about to put this entire thing together. So to get us started, you are going to need um, the Replit task open and you should also have the candidate booklet uh, PDF as well. And if you can't find that, then there's a link to it in the instructions um, in the Replit task. So we need to go through completing each of the tasks in the booklet. Now just a quick uh, overview of the code before we get started. First of all we've got this uh, from random import rand int line and that's just going to be used uh, when we do our dice simulation later or anytime we need a random number generated. We've got some global variables which we're going to use to store the players names um, and they have default values of player one and player two in case we don't enter a name. We have four variables that represent the counters. So each player has two counters, counter one, counter two. And they, uh, the values assigned to those variables are the board positions for each of those counters. So when we start the game, each of the counters for each player is in board position one. And we have another uh, global variable here called player turn, which just keeps track of whose turn it currently is. So when we start the game, it starts off as, as one, but as you'll see in a moment, we're gonna add a bit of randomization to that. Then we have some subroutines. So we've got this one built in called um, a clear screen. Very simple subroutine. It's just gonna print a new line character, which is like pressing enter 20 times. So that has the effect of just pushing whatever's on the screen up and out of the way. We also have this uh, quite long um, procedure called set color, which will change the output color from our print statements. And we use that just to print um, some nice colored messaging to our users. I'm just going to minimize that one because it's quite long. I'm going to get it out of the way. Then we have our main menu. Now, this is a really important one. It starts off by clearing the screen, setting the color to blue, and printing the Aquadu logo. So far, so good. Then it resets the color. Then we print out main menu centered with a character width of 60, which means it's going to fit roughly underneath um, our Aquadu logo. Okay, so we've got a string and we've centered it. And then we're going to print the options for our main menu. Enter player names, play game and quit. Now you might wonder where those options came from. Well, they come from the candidate booklet. Task one, develop a main menu for the program. The options in the menu should be enter player names, play game and quit. We also have um, a variable called menu choice, and we're going to take an input from the user. We've given them this prompt message, enter your choice one, two, or three, and we assign whatever they type in to the variable menu choice. We then test the value of menu choice. Now, you may not have seen lists before, but that's what this square bracket is saying. So this is saying if menu choice, which is whatever the user types in, is not in this list, and this list contains the string one, two, and three. So basically, if they type anything other than one, two, or three, then we're gonna say, sorry, that isn't a valid option. Press enter to try again. And at that point, none of the elifs will run, and that will be the end of our main menu function. However, when we call our main menu at the bottom of our program, so I'm, gonna, I'm gonna scoot right down there now, we call main menu right at the end of our program within a while true or effectively a forever loop. So of course, if they type in something that is invalid and we say, sorry, that's not a valid option, and then that's the end of our, our, of our procedure, then the procedure will just start up again, showing a clear screen, the main menu, and those options for the user. So let's suppose they've got something right. Let's say they've entered one, two, or three. Well, if they've entered one, at the moment we're just passing, which is a Python keyword, uh, pass, which just means I know I need something here to be syntactically correct because I've got uh, an elif statement, I've got a colon, so I must have something indented here. But basically it's, an, it's a nothing kind of statement. It won't do anything. So it's just a placeholder. We're going to replace that with the name of the subroutine that we need in order to change players' names because that's what option one is. Menu option two um, will actually kick the game off. So again, we're going to replace pass with the name of the subroutine that's going to run our game. And if they've entered th three for quit, then um, we've got the code for that. We're just going to ask a confirmation message. So I've got a variable sure, assign it the output, sorry, the input, um, from the user. Are you sure you want to quit? And we're prompting them enter Y or N for yes or no. 
and we're saying if sure, which is the variable stored in there, input, if sure dot lower, so let's convert it to lowercase, is equal to just a single y character, or sure dot lower is equal to the word yes, so if they've entered y or yes, then we say thanks for playing and we quit, and that's going to end um, the game from running. So before we go any further, let's just give that a go. Let's run our program and see what happens. Remember that when we run our program, we're going to call this while loop because everything else so far, everything else in our code, all of our code is all in subroutines. We haven't actually called those subroutines. The only bit of code that's going to run is the while loop, which starts our main menu. So let's run it and see what happens. So we've got our logo in blue. It says main menu, and it's asking us to enter the player names um, to play the game or to quit. So if I just, first of all, I'm going to test my validation and just say, well, what if I type something else? Sorry, that isn't a valid option. Press enter to try again, and I'm back to my main menu. Okay, let's see, assume that we've got this right. Let's do a number one, enter player names. And of course, it goes back to the main menu because we haven't got any code to run yet. Uh, same for two. It's gone back to the main menu. How about three for quit? Are you sure you want to quit? Well, let's say, uh, no, I don't. Okay, it's gone back to the main menu. Now let's say, yes, I do want to quit. Thanks for playing. Bye. And it ends. So, so far, so good. That's all working. Um, there's just a few more subroutines to look through. We've done the main menu. The next one is a very simple one called show turn. And it's going to access if player turn is one. Well, what's player turn? We haven't defined a variable or declared a variable called player turn. But actually, yes, we have. It's just it's up here. It's a global variable. And its scope, therefore, is outside of that function. So I'm referring to it here. I haven't had to use the global keyword because I'm not assigning a value to it, but I could have done. But it says if player turn is one, print, and I've got a formatted string here, so a string with a placeholder, and I'm gonna and it's gonna say it's somebody's turn. And I use this, uh, I'm gonna drop the value of the global variable p1 name, that gets dropped in here. So if that was Dave, it would say Dave's turn. And if it's not player one's turn, so else, then we're just going to print player two's name because it has to be player one or player two. Simple. Uh, then we're on to probably the most complex um, procedure that um, I've given you. And this one shows the board. So we're going to access each of the four counters, the global variables, and we print a header. Uh, and that's just going to say aquity. And then we have to have a little for loop here, and it works through each um, of the values from 1 to 11, because range goes up to, but not including the top number. So that's going to generate a list of numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. But I've then taken all of that and put it in this function, which reverses it. So actually, the values are going to go 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And this row is a variable that's going to take one of those values every time the for loop restarts. So when it begins, the value of row will be 11. The next time this for loop runs, it will be 10. The next time it runs, it will be 9. The next time it runs, it will be 8, and so on, until you get the, all the way down to it being 1 for the last time. So we say, okay, row is a number. It's the number of the row that we're sort of showing on the screen. So, we need to generate the start of each row. Now, this is a string that's going to appear on the left-hand side of the row when we print out our board. And we're saying, well, if the row is number 11, we want the row string to say, finish and 11. And the reason for that, if we look at our candidate booklet, is that our board says, if it's row 11, it should tell the user it's the finish row. Equally, 5 is a safe row, that's what this green means, and 1 is the start row. So going back to our code, we've got this that says, well, if row is 11, start my string off with the word finish and then the row number. Else if my row is 5, start my string off with the word safe and then row number 5. And if uh, else if my row is 1, then the row string should start with the word start and the number 1. If it's anything else, i.e. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 4, 3, and 2, 
then actually the row string should just start with this nice little vertical border character plus um, that number turned to a string, so whatever it is, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, right justified over 12 characters. And that's because there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 characters in um, each of these strings. So we want our numbers to line up, uh, so we have to make it um, right justified over a width of 12 characters. After that, we just add on um, our vertical uh, border as well. So it's going to just the row string, if it's that, we'll just start off with a vertical border, the number of the row, and another vertical border. Then, so that's the starters for each row. Then we have to generate um, what actually then appears after that on each row. And now it's going to show, let's go back to our board again. If we were printing this, if there's no counters, it just needs to show an empty box. But if the counter's value is the same as the row, i.e. let's say this counter has moved to row 3, then we would want to show that counter as we print out the row. So going back to our code, we do just that. We say, well, if row, if the row number is equal to the value of player 1's counter 1, then the row string should be the current value of row string, which is the start of it, plus... 1a to signify this is player 1's a counter. If um, the row is not that value, or if those value are not equal, so i.e. player 1's uh, counter is not in that row, then the row string is just equal to itself plus um, and then some spaces that is the equivalent width. And we do the same for the counter 2, so we say well if, if, if this row is where counter 2 is, then we need to show um, the row string is whatever it is up to now, which may or may not include 1a. And then we add on 1b, if indeed 1b is in that row. And if it's not, we add a gap. Then we keep going on. Um, so now row string is going to have covered all of the uh, width required to show player 1's counters. So now we get to checking against player 2 counters. Um, is the value of the row the same as the value of player 2 counter 1? If it is, show 2a in the row. If it's not, show a gap. And finally, if the row value is the same as player 2, counter 2, show 2b in the, in the row, and if not, show a gap. Then, um, by this point, row string will be quite long, because row string started here with a beginning. Then we added a value um, to it, um, either player 1's counter or a space. Then we added player 1's second counter or a space, and then player 2's first counter or a space, player 2's second counter or a space. We've, it's quite long now and we just have to shove on the end of it uh, this final vertical border just to finish it off. So that's generated a single string with the right data in it for the row and then we print it and then we just print a border beneath the row which is simply um, a plus symbol which gives us kind of like a nice uh, border corner and then um, a vertical uh, like hyphen to generate a vertical bar because we're going to have that hyphen multiplied by however long length the uh, row string now is um, minus two because we have um, these two uh, cross characters at either side so we don't want it quite the full width we want it just a bit smaller than the full width so that we can fit these corners in as well and then once we printed the board so that will run uh, that whole process happens 11 times. It happens for row 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And then eventually our for loop finishes and we're going to call show turn, which if you remember, just says whose go it is. So that's a huge amount of explanation of the built-in functions uh, and particularly of the row, uh, the draw board one or the show board one. But it's quite important that we understand it. If you don't understand it, don't panic too much uh, because as we go through the tutorial, we're going to make use of it. And that's one of the nice things about procedures and functions is you don't need to know how they work. You just need to know how to invoke them or call them. And in this instance, all we have to do is use the words show board uh, bracket bracket. And that will generate that will make this run. You don't really need to understand how it works. Um, you just need to be able to call it when you need it. So I'm just going to now uh, comment out while true and main menu, and I'm going to just make it run show board just to show you what it looks like. So notice that my um, 
all the players' character, uh, counters are in row one, so we should see that in our board when we run the board. So let's make this a bit bigger so we've got space, and let's run it and see what happens. So there's our board, there's our AquaDo header. Here's the row strings for each row, and on row one, you'll see the counters. And it's even said it's player one's turn. Now let's prove this works by messing around with some of the counter values. So let's imagine we've been playing for a little while and player one counter two is now on space three, uh, four might be on five and maybe, sorry, player twos might be on five and maybe player two's counter two might be on say row eight. So now I'm expecting to see uh, these counters in different positions on my board. So let's run it again and see what happens now. And there we go, you can see. So uh, 2B is indeed on row eight, 2A is on row five, 1b is on row 3 and 1a is on row 1. So our show board method is working. Brilliant. We are now ready to actually start putting some of our own routines into the game.